Hello everybody, welcome back to Own Automotive. I'm Richard Michael Owen, and today we're gonna go on a bit of a discovery with this 1967 E-Type on the hoist. It was purchased by my customer on Bring a Trailer. I'll put a link in the description below. But today what we're gonna do is we're gonna dissect this thing. We're gonna rip the heart out of this car and really see what my customer bought. And you never really know E-types and their mechanical condition thoroughly unless you strip it right down. So it's always a bit of a gamble buying an E-type. So there it is, that's the 4.2 liter engine. And I removed almost everything else out of the engine bay to give a really clear view of how it sits in the engine subframes here. Now I know what everybody's thinking, why is this red poking through? That's the original color of the car. And at some point it had a hasty restoration and somebody went through with a paintbrush and painted it black. Pretty typical for back in the day. Sometimes things are done on a budget. So yeah, I'm gonna take the cylinder head off here inside the car to use the weight of the car to take it off. It gets really stuck sometimes. And I already see some good stuff. If you look at these acorn nuts, they look like the original ones. So likely gonna replate these because new ones don't quite look the same. Okay, I'm excited, let's get into it. So the first thing I've done is removed all the original chrome domed acorn nuts. Then I got these funny washers underneath. I've never seen them before, so I'll show you guys what's up. Just trying to get this one off using a fiber tool because I don't want to mark up the cam cover, that's for sure. It's a frustrating when it's just, just a little too small. So here we go, you can see it's kind of rubberized on the bottom it's very thin it's warped i won't be reusing them and unfortunately i think i got a crack here i don't know if it shows up on camera but it looks like somebody was tightening down too hard on these acorn nuts in an attempt to seal this and has totally messed this cam cover up there's a crack right here all those washers are now off and i want to take this cam cover off and sometimes that can be one of the most difficult parts of the whole engine rebuild, believe it or not. So let's give this one a few taps and see where we're at here. Sounds kind of hollow. Oh, there we go. Easy does it. So there's the cam. You see the timing up front with the timing chain. Then I'm looking inside here. It looks nice and clean, but we can clearly see let me get a look behind the camera here that this one's junk. See that crack? Yeah, that's too bad. So we're looking for another cam cover set. I think this one has some big marks on it too. So looking for replacements there, but I do like what I see in here. Very, very clean. Okay, let's move on. Getting pretty close here to removing the cylinder head. Got the timing tucked inward. I've done this many times on other videos if you want to go look it up. And I was just noticing in the valley here, we have the engine number 7E12319-9. And this engine's really late. It has hardware that I usually see on Series 2E types. So we have the, the thin washer where the engine brackets are and a thicker one for just where the plain nuts are. And they look like they're actually black oxide. So we'll take them off, clean them up, and verify that. But yeah, let's see if this thing will lift off. Okay, I was getting ahead of myself. I want to free up the cylinder head studs here as much as I can with the hardware removed. You can see the studs poking out here. And I really want to free up this one. It's the dowel stud. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a sacrificial nut on here and just tap it and work it loose side to side. These studs are pretty flexible. And then also put some uh, spray down in there, some to lubricate it. So we can see the setup here. I got the back wheels on the ground. I don't want to flip the car right off the hoist. And dad's going to lift up. We're going to see if we're going to get any action here. Whole motor's moving up. 
Didn't come up right away, did it? Huh. It's lifting up the motor. Oh, it's lifting up the spring. Oh, it moved. It did? Oh, it popped up. Wow. Nice. Whoa, there we go. Nice. Not the timing gears, is it? Oh, yeah, nice. Good job. Woohoo! off. Kind of got it stuck with it. Okay, I've been cleaning up a bit here on the top of the deck and I really like what I see. This is really an exciting engine to take apart. So the first thing I did was I cleaned off the deck and I noticed that the grades were still nice and sharp, which tells me that this thing's never been decked. And then I immediately started cleaning one of the piston tops. Piston number four here is the original piston from the factory, graded F to match the bore, and uh, stamp number four, which is really, really exciting. So I haven't taken apart an engine like this since the junk E-type engine, and that thing was a hunk of junk. It was totally seized, and this is just the opposite. So I'm really happy about that. I want to talk about these studs. So you can see this longer one here is showing a lot of corrosion, and that's because coolant at one point has ingressed into here. I don't know if that was from this cylinder head gasket. It looks maybe like coolant could have been getting in there, but I'm not quite sure. Now, when these things corrode like this, they weaken severely. They make it really hard to get the cylinder head off. And these longer ones, if I go over here to the dowel stud, it's dowel because it has a dowel down here built into the stud. It actually has a relief here, a curve the wrong way and this, the cylinder head stud, the cylinder head, sorry, just get bound up on these. So yeah, really excited. What does everybody think? This is a low mileage, 30,000 mile engine. Let's get into it. Got the cylinder head here draining. It's nice to fully drain it before you put it level. Otherwise you just get oil and coolant everywhere. And what can we say? It looks incredible. The water passages here show no signs of corrosion. In fact, this might be the original machining from the factory. Definitely was an oil burner. That's why we see the black deposits in the combustion chambers. But yeah, I'm really happy. Once we get this thing cleaned, I think it's going to come out pretty nice. Oh, and another thing too, these are all the original studs. They have a bit of a divot at the end. See that? That's what all original studs look like. So yeah, we'll take all those out and replate those as well. But wow, what an amazing cylinder head. This is going to be a really, really great engine to put together. Okay, time to take the engine out of the body. You can see I've supported the body at the rear because I don't want to flip the whole body off the hoist. Now the engine can be removed with the bonnet, the, the hood fully attached as you see here. And the idea is, I'm just going to lift it up slightly, then we can remove the motor mounts, and then I'll disconnect the transmission mount, I'll show you what that looks like, and then we are just going to drop it down one foot here onto that wooden pedestal, and yeah, pretty easy process, uh, let's do it. Here we go, got the entire unit on the floor. So the first thing I want to do is lighten the load. So that's going to mean taking the transmission and bell housing off. To make that possible, definitely have to disconnect the slave cylinder system here and these brackets. 
So for anybody following along, the engine serial number is right here, 7E12319-9 for high compression. Gonna have a lot of interesting steps. Getting these corroded studs out is not gonna be a pleasure, but we'll get into that. Got a lot of parts cleaning ahead of us. And I wanna take this plate off too. I leave it on to install and remove from the car, but right now I have to take it off because this spring is compressed, it's under tension. You might want to push this plate up and disconnect it instead of doing that on the bench. All right, well, let's get this thing apart. Okay, let's divorce these two. Last bowl. Should be it. Okay, let's see how does it feel. Any more height on this? A little bit maybe. There. Okay, it's off the dowels. Look at that, look at that in there. Looks pretty greasy. Hey, a nice release bearing. Could be a sign of good things. All right, shall we lift it up and put it down? Lift it back down. Yep. Okay, with these two apart, can definitely learn a little bit more about the history of this engine and transmission. So this definitely was a replacement pressure plate. I can tell by the new hardware there holding it on. So we're gonna replace these for the cost of a new pressure plate and release bearing. We always fit new. So this flywheel, it looks like the original flywheel. It's slightly chewed up, see that? Um, it's right on the edge though. I think this is usable. Now to replace the ring gear is a big process. These things are really, really strong steel. And for the price, it's almost worth it just to outright replace it. So. A little bit on the fence about this one, but I'm leaning towards saving the original and just running with this. And I'll put a regular starter on here to kind of preserve those teeth as best we can. Now inside the bell housing, a lot of deposits. This is pretty normal. It either comes from the rear main seal in the engine or from the front trans seal. And we see the release bearing in there. It has a carbon release bearing. And this one has a ton of meat on it. So barely driven since the clutch job was done. And now I'm looking at that lock wire. It looks like this bell housing has been off the transmission. So likely the transmission has been serviced at some point too. There's little rust in the dowels and it just holds up a little bit. Here we go. Still in the last dowel. <laughs> just a little corrosion on there holds it on. Go. Oh, come on, that last towel. There it goes. All right, so this is our flywheel surface. Uh, yeah, it definitely needs to be machined. It has a lot of grooves in it. Pressure plate looking a little better. And the clutch here with lots of meat on it because it was installed not that long ago. But yeah, we'll be renewing all this. So. Definitely gonna have to take some material off of this flywheel and uh, gotta get off next. It's really weird looking. Going to take the flywheel off next. We can see the original engine number stamped on it. So this is the original flywheel. And likely it's never been off the engine because it shows a lot of wear on the flywheel despite having a new clutch. And I put a red marker there so it can be put back on in the same orientation. Now we're gonna gently tap this off. It's on these dowels. There's one right there, another one at the top here. So that's the process, just gently tapping it off and then letting the foam mat catch it. Okay, just going in close to the crankshaft flange here. This is a real antiquated design, kind of a design flaw actually. So the seal is in behind the flange, so there's no way to get to it without removing the crankshaft wholesale from the engine. If this was a more modern design, the flange would be much smaller so the oil seal could just slip right over. 
Um, there are some uh, kits available to convert it to a modern type seal, lip seal or split seal. I'm not a huge fan of those. I just run the rope seal and they work fine. As we can see, these things leak a lot from the top anyhow. That's where most of the leaks tend to come from. So yeah, one, the one thing I wanna do before I put it on the engine stand here is just these three machine screws. Gonna take them out because the engine stand will block them. Okay, let's get this up in the air. Enough work on the ground. Okay, got the engine here loaded on the engine stand. You can see my setup. Just use the attachment points where the bell housing was previously. So yeah, at the working height now, we can definitely do a better job of disassembly so the oil pan can come off. Then the timing gear, timing case, and then these studs, which looks like a lot of fun. Then we'll get into measuring the bores and see how much wear there is on this engine. But yeah, it's looking pretty nice. I'm looking here at a lot of original hardware, original black oxide hardware. So likely this thing's never been apart. Uh, let's see, let's find out. Okay, so we're looking inside the oil pan here. You can see the baffle system. That's where the pickup is in that circular area. And it looks super clean. So this might be one really spectacular engine. So next on the list is the timing cover. It kind of gets sandwiched between the block and the water pump. So that will have to come off. Just want to make sure that I get these spacer washers in correctly. So I'm noting that for when it goes back to reinstall. And there's also spacer washers right here as well for the alternator bracket. What else? So yeah, we have the what they call the jockey pulley system. So just gonna have a look at this. Wanna put back it back in the same way as well. So next I wanna take off this water pump. It is an aftermarket water pump. A giveaway was the metric bolts holding on the pulley. And yeah, this will give us a window into the water jacket. So I'm really curious to see what lies behind. There it is, came right off. Okay, so really looking good. So when I when these things get really corroded, it's just a pitted mess in the timing cover there. And this one looks exceptional. Okay, more good news. Let's keep going. So here we are, this is the bottom of the engine. This is the harmonic balancer crankshaft damper and it has to come off. Now I like to leave the pulley on there because this is an integrated balanced unit and if this uh, was to split into two, want to put it back the same way. So yeah, let's get it off and see what the rubber looks like on the other side. So that's the big crank nut and washer there. Okay, we're off. Good thing I had the foam pad on the floor. So let's have a look here. So we can see this is the rubber. So this is a, a balancer with rubber. It's a bonded rubber. And this one looks pretty good, pretty reusable. So likely just refinish this as we see it here. Don't want to split off the pulley and go right back on. Here's the tapered spacer that the damper sits on. So yeah, now we can withdraw the whole cover. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, let's see how this timing cover comes off. It has two dowels up top here. I don't think any down below. So it should come off with the seal around the crankshaft nose there. Just want to be gentle with it. Yeah, just wiggle it off by hand now. There it is, we're free. The pan 
and gasket holder. Okay, so there we are. Definitely see the lower timing chain here. There's the tensioner and the guides. Looks like the tensioner is pretty far out. Might even be the original one. How about that? Looks nice and clean in here too. That's what I'll note. So yeah, this whole assembly will come off all at once. We'll show that. Okay, so the first thing I wanna do is take the tension off the chain. This is a hydraulic tensioner. So all pressure pushes this um, plunger out and puts pressure on this chain. This chain is stretched over time. And that's why the plunger is so far out of the tensioner. It looks like the original one, everybody. I think this is an all original setup here. So I'm gonna take it out and show everybody the little hydraulic um, pathway that feeds this thing. Likely when I take this out, the plunger's gonna go, gonna rip across the shop here. It's kind of hard to grab. Oh, there we go. Okay, so the tensioner went flying across the room. It just has a little bit of spring tension in it there. And one thing to note is that this is the oil way that feeds the tensioner, and it has this fitting in here that restricts it. It goes, goes down to a tiny little hole there, so there's not a lot of pressure that feeds the tensioner. And if I get my pick in here, there actually is a wire mesh, see that? And it's important to take this out It'll have some material on it. This one does right here. And take that out, clean it out, and refit it when uh, rebuilding an engine. Yeah, it's really important. So yeah, watch out for this uh, mesh and also for this fitting. Okay, I'm gonna take the whole assembly all together off the car. Sprockets, chains, everything. Let's see how this goes. Take the bolts out. I think there are some spacers in here that generally do fall out. Here it comes. Yeah, there's those spacers for them. They're really elegant, Rich, really elegant. Yeah, but it's off, right on, look at that. Beautiful. Okay, really good sign. I'm just analyzing these guides here. They look like the original ones that were fitted. See that? And there's lots of rubber on here, vulcanized rubber, which is only a sign of one with really low miles. There's even, I don't know if you can see it on camera. Yeah, you can. It says metalastic on the edge here. And this, these also, these upper guides don't have a lot of wear either. And I think they are original. So this has to be a low mileage engine. Um, the very best one I've ever taken apart, yeah. What a privilege. Awesome. So here we are now. This is the end of the crankshaft. That's the distance piece there. We always replace those because that's a seal surface. Having a look at the sprockets here. Do show a little bit of wear. So it's the side loading that I'm looking at with this sprocket. See that? I don't know. It's hard to see those little dark areas. So definitely a new sprocket for the crankshaft. But the next task I'm not really looking forward to are these cylinder head studs. So I'm gonna use the double nut technique and uh, I'll get all the way to this one then I'll start recording. You think this is gonna come out pretty easy? What do you think everybody? Looks pretty corroded. So yeah, give me, so, give me a minute here and then uh, we'll get to this one. See, I'm using the double net technique. Try to shock that stud out of the block. And uh, let's see if it will get turn out of there. There we go. These front ones, I think are easy because these a bit of oil is all around here, this area. Well, can we climb Everest together? It's looking pretty solid, but I got the nice wrenches there to the right. I'll show you a bit of the secret sauce. Okay, so here's what makes this possible. My dad modified a cylinder head nut here, one of those dome nuts, cut off the top, and that's gonna give me a lot of threads to get a lot of friction and hopefully withdraw this stud that's not looking very nice. So I'll put this one in inverted. 
that in there. So just a little trick what I do is I really dig this down into the stud like that. Okay. So next we can cap this one off with a regular cylinder head nut. And this will really take advantage of all of the threads of the stud to withdraw it. So we'll go like this. I want to get this extremely tight. All right. So next up, I'm just going to see if I can slide down below here. I can't. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the longer of the two spanners and uh, we're going to give her a go and see what happens here. The upper one really, really adds stability. Come on. Ah, oh, nothing. Okay, let's try my hammer technique. And let's tighten down a little more. I can't get any tighter than that. There we go. Okay, make sure it's still in focus here. Okay, come on now, come on. Shouldn't use the open end like this, but we'll give it a go. Let's see what happens here. Let's see what happens. Oh yeah, did you see that? We have movement. Awesome. Look at that, anything's possible in this world. There it is. Let's have a look here, see what's going on. So there really wasn't a whole lot of corrosion in the threads themselves. So that's why I was able to withdraw that without going nuclear. Awesome. Okay, start this again. Okay, for the first time in uh, 50 years, let's uh, flip the engine upside down. Good catch. Glad we got the basin. Oh, look at that. Awesome. Let that drip for a bit. Uh, no more. Yeah, we're locked. Okay, gonna do a tour of the underside of this engine. There's the pickup tube for the oil pump. And the 3.8 ones have a smaller diameter tube, so watch out for that. This is the original 1967 oil pump, Holborn Eaton Rochester. And you can see it's drive if I go down like this. So there's a bit of a shaft there and a gear which runs off the crankshaft. It also drives a distributor. So this is very, very old school technology. We have lock tabs and cotter pins on the big ends. We don't use soft metals in engines anymore. Look, one of these cotter pins has completely gone missing. So that's why uh, it's kind of old tech. We don't use soft metal when we assemble engines. And uh, we'll take off this section here. It has the rope seal. So yeah, gonna do some disassembly, then measurement. Let's take apart this oil pump. We get an idea of how much metal's gone through this engine by looking at the lobes. Take out the retaining bolts here for the cap. Those are out. And the top here should come off. And there we are, that's the inside of the oil pump. So this moves around and rotates and creates oil pressure. Let's take the rotor out. Here we go. Now what I'm looking for is where on the very edge. So look at that. Something's definitely gone through the engine. See that? Look at that damage there. Maybe it was that cotter pin. Here too. Same. Oh, the same. I see the same wear on all lobes. Never seen this before. Look at that. Something was stuck in there and damaged all four lobes. Isn't that something? So definitely not reusing this oil pump. 
yeah, very interesting to do some archaeology here. Okay, next up, I want to start removing the main caps, but this one actually interferes with the gear for the distributor and oil pump drive. And this is the, uh, the connection point, I guess, between the drive and the oil pump itself. And I have made a socket out of an old one that'll let me take off this nut here for this gear. Sometimes these nuts are really stubborn. I have videos of me using impact gun on them, but maybe this one will just come off. Let's see what happens. Come on. <laughs> of course. There you go. Did it come? Yeah. Was that it? That was it. Sweet dog. Look at that. It's a thing of beauty. I didn't have to use any heat. I didn't ruin the gear. Awesome. Just punch that down now. Job well done. Okay, what are the odds that our first bearing is going to look good? What are the odds? 50%? I think it's going to look pretty good. After 50 years, let's have a look. It will come off of there. Oh, come on. <laughs> just tap on down. Yeah. Give it a bit of a tappy tap. Come on. There we are. Not a lot of tension on those rings. That was about to fall out. Here we go. I'll make sure my piston doesn't fall out. Okay. Bearing is stuck. Let me get it out of there. <laughs> Oil tension's holding it on. Okay, here we go. Moment of truth. What do we got? Whoa, that's looking really nice. Is that the original bearing from 67? Standard, look at that. With the part number on it. This is gold, people, this is gold. Wow, that is impressive. It's like new, isn't it? Pretty good so far. All right, let's see what this piston looks like. Just very gently remove it without touching the crank journal. Okay, it's just pushing down and out. Trying to get it over the ridge there. Be very careful with it. Very light. This isn't a junk E type engine. This is a E type perfection engine. Okay, what do we got here? Okay, look at that. There's the original piston. Oh my, my. Look at that. Looking very nice. So, one thing we will have to do is measure the top piston groove for where. If that looks good, then we're gonna be able to reuse these, believe it or not. But yeah, that looks really nice. Look at that, minimal. Original piston, amazing. Well, while we're here, may as well have a look at a main cap. And uh, this one's fun because it has the, the rope seal. that there's the anti-seize put on there from the factory it has a really particular smell get rid of that lock tabs Ugh. okay so let's pry off this main cap one tip I learned from a viewer is that uh, you can wiggle Put a bolt in here and wiggle it back and forth as you pry. I'm just gonna take it easy. It's just on two dowels, really. There it goes. There it goes. Okay, whoa, the crank looks good, and look at the bearing. Woohoo! That is amazing, guys. What a gift. What a gift this engine is.
Sorry if the camera jumped there. I forgot that there's two machine screws on the other side of this carrier. Now this one's unique because it holds the rope seal as we're gonna see. So it should just lift up off the dowels. Gentle with it. There we are. And this is a peculiarity of the Jaguar system. Here we have a scroll. You can just barely see the scroll and a slinger. And that slings oil, can you see what I'm doing here? Yep, back into this area here and back into the engine. It's possible actually to install this the wrong way. Install it like this, and then instead of the oil going back in the engine, guess what, it goes all over the floor. So uh, yeah, I could see somebody doing a lip seal conversion just based on uh, putting this around the wrong way. But yeah, it looks really nice. What happens sometimes is that the, the bearings wear out and the crankshaft scroll here starts eating away at this carrier and that's when you end up with problems. But this one looks really good. It's pristine. And another thing I'm gonna notice here is that from the factory, look at this, they staggered the rope seals. There's a lot of talk about staggering the rope seal, whether it's necessary or not. And this is proof that they did it from the factory. Very interesting. Moved outside here, and that's because I want to deal with what are called the sludge plugs. There's six of them in the crankshaft. Here's one right here next to that main cap we took off. And a lot of people don't get into this area. They see those three pins, and they're like, nope, going to leave that in there. But we're going to take it out and see what's lurking behind there. So I'm going to apply some heat, and you'll see me heat her up red hot, and we'll see if it'll uh, come out, see what's in there. Okay, let's cook it. Okay, got it pretty hot here. Let's see if we get any movement. So now I'm going to go in with the half inch hex and see if we get any movement. So I really want to get make sure it's in there, so I'm going to tap it in there. Okay, let's see what happens. Oh, look at that. It's just loose. That heat really does a lot of work. Okay, it's out. So it's a really, really weird coarse thread. See that, the plug? I get pull the focus there. Yeah, there's the plug there. Now, on inspection here, and what we'll see here is that in here is be tons of gunk. See that? This one's actually not plugged up as, mu as much as a lot of them are. Now, what is this? This is uh, heavy metals and lead that through centrifugal force has been left inside the crankshaft. And if these plugs didn't come out, this dirt and muck would stay in the crankshaft. That's a big no-no. So I'm really happy to take these out, clean it out properly with a hot tank and uh, replace the plugs. Okay, back in the shop now, I got all six of the sludge plugs out. We can see them sitting here. And this one on the very right, it was starting to ruin the sludge plug and I didn't want to make it a circle and have it stuck in there. So I just drilled out the three peens, and then it came out. That's a little trick. So what's going on here? Why are these sludge plugs here and why do I need to take them out? Well, these cavities here, this large oil way, it actually feeds oil from the main bearing here to the large end bearing on the rod. And it's hard to see here, but there's a hole up in there. If you pull focus, come on. But yeah, there's a hole in there and that feeds the rod. So if this sludge here would have, would have been filled anymore, it would not have fed the rod. And you can see if I just peel it away here, there it is, there's all that sludge, that cake. And that's what I want to get out because if that builds up too much, 
the big end bearings uh, will have a lot of trouble. And one last thing I'll note is I do like to do this as the rods are coming out. It work holds the whole crankshaft quite nicely to take them out. So um, yeah, bit of a bonus. Okay, let's get this thing out. Okay, time to measure the bore wear, probably the most significant measurement to give us an indication of how healthy this engine block is. So we've got the bore gauge and it's set to the piston diameter. And this will let us know where we're at. So we're on number four number one piston number one is that four thou five thou almost yeah that's four thou four thou skirt clearance let's just go down the that's road. at the top where it's unworn and then we're going to go down and there's a bit more there isn't there it looks like there's good Two and a half thou, maybe, when you're down there, so you're all the way down. Not in the quite middle. A bit further. So, is that two and a half there? This is below the below the pistons. So this is should be the same as the top of the bore. Yeah, it is. So, got four thou where it's unworn. See down there, where the rings weren't touching. Then we go up to the top here. Level it out. There it is. So how much is that? That that's like two and a half thou. What is that? That's one six six three thou. six so 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 that's three thou taper. So this is zero. Yeah. So it's five plus one. I would say it's um, six thou. So it went from four to six. Uh -huh. So two thou taper wear on piston number one. Which is pretty damn healthy. Uh -huh. It's going a little further. Two thou. Two thou, yeah. So very, very little wear on this cylinder block looking like 3000 is the max i think that's within tolerance just to re-ring this engine but we'll have a look at the pistons check the skirt clearance and we'll go from there i'd say if you really want to know well number five was three awesome So now on to the crankshaft and we did a bit of cursory measuring and just like the cylinder block, very, very little wear, not even a half a thou on the rod. So that's really, really impressive. But as again, we can see the bearing shells here looking very nice. The only thing I can note is water damage. See up in these, maybe if I move the light right. Yeah, you can see that water damage in there. Same with the thrust bearings. They were really nice except for a little bit of water damage so really glad to get in there and replace these bearings but as far as this crankshaft is concerned it's a low mileage unit don't need to touch it just clean it we'll replace the sludge plugs that we took out and it's going to be an awesome standard crankshaft that won't need any machining And the last part of the equation are the pistons, the original pistons and rods to this engine. Now my dad has spent a bit of time measuring the outer diameter of the piston on the thrust side. They were on the thrust side, so this is the thrust side. You can see the scoring here, and there is very little material lost here. So these pistons, as far as the outer dimension, are perfectly usable. Now where used pistons kind of fall flat is the piston ring groove. So there is movement 
of the ring inside the groove and that's from the natural movement going up and down and these ones have about five thou on the upper groove which is about two thou out of normal range so there's a couple approaches to dealing with this problem one would be just to put new rings in except that it's slightly out of spec and maybe the car will have a little bit more blow by but be a very wonderful and usable car like the junkie type engine is here i just put new rings in pretty worn piston grooves and it worked out just fine now if you want to take this a step further if you really want to save the pistons they can be machined these grooves can be machined out for a spacer that would save the pistons and the other option is to outright replace the pistons and then if you're replacing the pistons you may as well go 10 thou over bore out the block and make it perfect so a bunch of options there i will discuss with the owner what they would like to do but really impressive engine really nice to see all these original components pretty much unworn except for that groove so yeah let's figure out what we're doing So really happy to have the engine completely disassembled and before we measure it, it's sitting right in front of us. Gonna just switch gears a bit and show you my side project. So this is the Junkie type with the Junkie type engine. I think it's had over 8,000 miles. And the reason why it's in is I had a bad differential noise. So that's it, time for a rear end rebuild. So there's a cart in place of the rear end. And now you can see some of the parts here left over. Um, yeah, so here's the main drive shafts and the splines. I took the hubs off and replacing those. These were in with Loctite, so they need to be heated up a bit, and they were quite hard to get the hubs off the splines, but I'll be, re be replacing those. Now I have the hub carrier units here, the uprights. This is the wheel bearings. I don't think I'm going to replace them, because if you look at the race here in the light, it is, that's just a bit of grease there. They are perfect. So I'm going to retain the wheel bearings, but there are some smaller bearings here that go around the pivot point and they had moisture in them. Look at that race, completely pitted out. So I'll be replacing those. They go in there. And then we have the differential here. It's all apart. I think this is as original. So this is the original kind of primer paint. And I think the way that this was originally done was it was painted completely with this kind of reddish, light reddish paint. And then it was machined, put together, and a lot of these surfaces left bare to rust. So kind of an interesting exercise. I don't know quite how I'm going to refinish this, but definitely want to get rid of some of this corrosion where these surfaces left flat, had no paint protection. Same with some of the things like the bearing carriers. Again, no paint. So what do you do to restore this? I mean, I could acid clean it and leave it bare metal to rust again, but I think I'm going to have to coat it with some sort of coating. And I have to repair a lot of like the flange, the seal surfaces here. So this is the output flange. And this is the seal surface right here. And I just like to dress these up and polish them up before it goes all back together. And I am gonna change the ratio from 354 to 288. So I'll keep you guys updated on this project as it goes, but I'm not gonna get too thorough into a rebuild, a rear end rebuild video here, but definitely just keep you updated on how the progress goes. Next, I'm just gonna paint this up in preparation for the new bearings and the new crown and pinion. All right, I think I got a plan. I was just wire brushing some of this corrosion off the case itself. And then I thought to myself, you know, this is where all the shims go. This is the shim for the carrier, for the inside, the differential. And these are some shims for the pins, for the lower control arm, essentially. And so what I've done here is I've just filed this, so I've made sure it's flat. So some of this damage isn't going to protrude and cause a false reading on the shimming. And next, I'm just going to take some of this rust converter here from Worth. I'm going to put it over these areas that have some high corrosion. Let this sit for 48 hours and top coat it. Now, when I top coat this, I will mask off these areas where the shims are because you can't really have paint mixing with shims that just will not create an accurate uh, measure in the long term. The paint will uh, not work for correctly shimming anything and that's why the factory left these surfaces here bare. But I will mask this off and paint this area so it won't corrode nearly as badly in the future right here.
Next up, I'm gonna dress up all my seal surfaces for the rear end. This is the output flange. It definitely looks like it wasn't painted. And this is the seal surface here. And this is what I wanna dress and get as good as possible. Now, if this showed signs of pitting, it would probably need replacement or some cutting on the lathe, but I'm just gonna polish the surface. It still looks pretty good. And also have an inspection here where it meets the drive shaft. Just wanna make sure that there's nothing protruding and it's sitting nice and flat. So yeah, I'll show you my process here. I'm just gonna put it in the lathe and polish it with sandpaper. You can see the result. Okay, just finished up. That went all the way to 1500 grit. You can see the result here, that mirror-like finish, just giving that seal the best chance it has. So now I'm gonna mask this off and we'll refinish the rest of this part. But yeah, that's the way I dress my seal surfaces. Pretty shiny. Yeah, so here's the drive shafts, the inner drive shafts for the differential. There is a seal surface right here. So we'll dress that up. I have to change the jaws in the lathe. I'll show you the result. Okay, let's see the result. There it is. So really gonna give that seal a fighting chance. Looks like chrome. Great. Well, before and after here, of course, the one on the right is the one I just polished. I think it's good insurance against uh, leaks in the future. What does everybody think? So there we have it. Got a lot of wonderful refinished parts here gleaming back at me. So you saw me painting the differential casing here and the uh, two-part urethane I have is very similar to the color of the outside of the car. Now I really wanted to mimic what the factory did so all these shim surfaces didn't get any paint and uh, that's a good thing. Don't want paint in between the shim stock and the case. It'll just rattle loose. Now I definitely kind of over restored these output shafts with the two part black urethane, but I think it just looks so wonderful. And I think in some cases these parts were left bare metal and in other cases the factory after this thing was assembled, there was some black paint sprayed in and around, especially the rear cover and some of these pieces here just to mitigate the corrosion. And what else can I say? Yeah, so definitely just have a coat of sealer here where the flange meets the drive shaft and anything else gets a nice thick coat of urethane. I just love these uh, sealed surfaces looking so beautiful. So yeah, this is all gonna go to my rebuilder, which is a really nice touch, how we can refinish it to a high level and then have it rebuilt professionally inside. Maybe today, later on, we can go and see what the innards look like. In the meanwhile, I have these hubs that I've cleaned up. So these went through the parts washer and they got a mild acid clean. That's the way I like to do it. No abrasives. I don't have to worry about getting abrasives stuck down in there. Uh, that will just work loose and ruin all my bearings. And I got some shim stuck for my rebuilder as well. So I'm gonna get this differential back all together as one. But in the meanwhile, gonna put together these hubs and then get this rear end back in the car. Now, while my differential is being set up by an expert, I'm gonna go ahead and prepare the hub carrier for the rest of the suspension. And to show you what's going on here, we can look in the shop manual. So there's the hub carrier, and it really connects to the lower control arm with this shaft. And it's retained by bearing shims in a spacer tube. So for my purposes, I like to order this kit from S&G Barrett, C16029FK. It comes with everything we see here. And this replaces all this old nasty hardware, rusty hardware, old rusty felts. Uh, so I am a big fan of this kit. Now, these wheel bearings are really common. You can see the part number there, 132009. It'll need two per side. 
And these are really held in with this spacer tube. So if you can imagine both the bearings on either side with some shims that are provided in this kit, and then it's squeezed together with this spacer tube in the housing on the races, and it's important to get the right amount of crush. So that's what we're going to do. But before we do that, I gotta get these new races in there. The reason why I'm replacing this is because these races only wear in a tiny little area. So if you can imagine this thing moving up and down, how little this would pivot. So it always wears in the same spot and that's why they need to be replaced. Not to mention the ingress of water does not help. So first thing I do is we'll heat up this hub carrier and tap in the races. Okay, the hub's just heating up. Gonna have a look at my race here. Looking really good there. So we got an inch and five eighths, just like we want. Let's take the hub off the heat. Ooh, it's hot. And I always want to inspect my parent bore, make sure there's nothing down in there that's gonna stop this race from seeding. Now it's still hot. Gonna, oh, I can barely touch this. It's just gonna fall in there. This thing's so hot. Oh, gotta wear gloves. So I have the soft side of my mallet. I'm just going to start it. Right. Then I have this, uh, this race tool. Tap it all the way down there. There we are. One race installed. Got to do the other side next. So with those races installed, the next step is to figure out the proper crush for the wheel bearings and this distance tube and these shims, all five that are provided with the kit. Now to do this, it's best to use a plate like this with a shaft on it. This came from my friend, Simon Scott. He made it just for this purpose. So now you can see the first wheel bearing going on. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the distance tube on the shaft. It acts directly on the bearings. Then all five of these 4,000 shims. So I'll use everything that came in the kit. So put those on, and then, here's the magic. I can take the hub, which is still a little warm, and we're gonna slide it onto the shaft here, just as a work holding. There we are. And then, in goes the second wheel bearing, and I'll put some spacers in here, and then we'll tighten it up, and we'll see the play and make an adjustment based on that. Jaguar calls for two thou crush. So, let me get a nut on here. I only have one hand and uh, we'll get back to you. Okay, got the camera stationary. Now I have both hands. So I got the oil spacer here. Can put that on the end and a large washer. This also came from my friend Simon. So once we tighten this down, don't need to tighten. It's the, the workshop manual calls for 50 pounds, but I'm just gonna give it maybe 20 here. Don't wanna damage the shims too much. There we are. Now, this has a bit of movement back and forth. I don't know if that comes through very much, but you can hear it clicking. And what we wanna do is measure that because we don't want any clearance, just a slight bit of crush. So the way I'm gonna do that here is by measuring with a feeler gauge in between the washer and the hub carrier um, all the way at one end while I'm kind of um, moving the bearing and setting it and all the way on the other way too. So I'm measuring the full travel of those wheel bearings with the feeler gauge. And then once I figure out the, how much uh, free play I have, I can eliminate it by taking out those spacers. So hopefully that makes sense. Look at that. Looks like I have about six thou play. Yeah, I do, six thou play. So probably if I remove two and then I apply a bit of crush, I don't think this will lock up. So we'll try that first. Now 
Now with the races fully installed in the carrier and knowing how much distance I need between the wheel bearings, we can permanently install them. And to do that, they're retained by the felt oil seal retainer here. It's kind of an unusual arrangement. Here's the original one. It didn't really keep water out, to be honest. So here's the retainer. It goes into the hub like this. Then there's the felt that goes in there. You can see the original felt. Yep, it was holding moisture and rust. Then there's this, what's this called? The oil seal track. Then another spacer that goes over top of that. So this definitely isn't a watertight solution, a positive uh, seal. But if there's enough grease, I guess, in the felt, then it will repel the water. So the method here is going to be to install the wheel bearings and then push this retainer in. Now these retainers are 10 thou crush and no amount of hammering will get it into the aluminum housing. Instead, we're gonna go over to the press. Okay, moved over to the press here. Got a nice setup for this hub. So in will go the wheel bearing itself. Oh, come on. The spacer ring. And then we'll put the retainer on the top. They have this nice wide flat tool in here that should press it down in an even manner. Let's see if we can get this on the camera here. Make sure that I'm centered properly with the tool. And down we go. There it goes in. Wonderful. So there it is in there. Okay, so the first wheel bearing is in the hub. Now I'm gonna use this dummy shaft to keep everything lined up for the next pressing. So that'll go through here. The dimensions for this are in the manual. What that'll let me do is slide in the spacer tube and the, the shims that we measured for earlier before we press in the final felt retainer. Okay, so I pressed in the second felt seal retainer. I'm just gonna give it some taps just to make sure it's seated all the way down. that on both sides. Now the next step, believe it or not, is to replace this dummy shaft with a second one that's a little longer that'll just hold it together until we need to attach this to the lower control arm. This will just keep that shim and that spacer tube all in line. All right, on to the next step. So now I have the auto fulcrums just as I want them, all shim correctly. I can move on to the hubs. So this is a new old stock hub I'm gonna be installing into the left-hand side here. And I like to replace these because these splines here, they do wear over time. So it's a bit of a maintenance item. Now this goes into the hub carrier via the wheel bearings. I'm reusing the old ones. Those are repacked with grease. Had an inspection on those and the races that are in the hub here and they all look really nice. So this process will be kind of tricky. There is a measurement we're gonna do with a depth micrometer. It's a specialty way to set up the wheel bearing clearance. That's a little different from the shop manual, so that'll be a lot of fun. Let's get into it. Gonna do a couple checks here before I proceed. One is just using the knockoff and verifying that indeed this is a left-hand hub. Don't wanna mix that up all the way deep into the assembly process. So I can see it's winding on and undoing correctly. Of course, the knockoff, so this is indeed the left hand hub. So the next thing I'm gonna check is that it works with the drive shaft spline. So when I line up the hole here for, that's on the cotter pin at the end of this spline, it'll go together and uh, go all the way down. See like that? There we are. So now that's gonna work. Don't feel any play in there. That's good. One last thing here is the distance piece. So this is the distance piece. It's gonna be part of the oil seal, of the grease seal. So I wanna make sure that that'll go all the way down there. It's not sticking proud. That's good. 
with all those checks in place, I can take the outer bearing, the larger of the two, and can set it into the hub. We're gonna install this right now. So I like to just set it on the bench here. I'm gonna need something else to tap it with, and uh, then we'll go over to the press. There we go, I'll use that. Just start it here on the bench. There it is. It's all the way down. I like to use the press just to be sure we're all the way down. Next up, I want to put in the grease seal, the outer grease seal. This seal is a little tight and this edge is pretty sharp. So it takes a bit of perseverance, but uh, let's see if we can get it. I always like to put my seals in with a little bit of silicone. So I'm just going to put a little bit and seat it all the way around. Should have gloves on. So I'm going to set it in like that and hold it down this side and tap it down on this side. It's in. Okay, with this seal in now, I can install the hub. So I'm going to turn the carrier upside down and you can put it over top of the hub and then install the inner wheel bearing. Now this I'm just going to tap because the, the stop point is going to be on the race itself so it's too much for the press. I'm just going to get to start just some light taps here and hopefully we can get this thing driven down there. So let's see how that looks. I just, yeah, so the bearings are tight now and uh, that's exactly where I wanna be. We can move on to the next step. Now, before I put the hub carrier into the vise to take a very specific measurement, I just kinda wanted to explain it together here with this shaft. So envision, if you will, I put the hub onto this shaft. We have a big nut and washer squeezing the wheel bearings together. There has to be a spot, something that holds it back that stops it from just tightening those up, those bearings and locking them in place. And that actually is this tiny little shim spacer washer here. This acts on the end of the hub and this acts on the end of the bearing. So it's really critical that this spacer here is set correctly for two to six thou play. These come in dimensions from A to R, that's 109 thou to 151 thou. And it, I guess it's really the simplest way to think about it is that these shims here, they really just go on the end and really they want to stick proud of the bearing by two to six thou to allow some play. So let's go over to the vise. Okay, I'm on the bench here. Bearings are tight. Oh, look at that, it still has some play. So I gotta do a little bit more tapping. Okay, let's seat these down. Okay, zoomed in now so we can get a great look at what's going on here. There's no play in the hub. The bearings are locked tight. Now what I need to know is the difference between the bearing surface here and the hub which is recessed down inward. And to get this measurement, I'm gonna use this spacer. It's, it's a hub spacer. It's exactly 500 thou, so half an inch. I could put that on the bearing surface and the depth micrometer can go onto the spacer and then we can get an accurate reading. We'll subtract 500 thou for the difference. So now if I just go down to 600 thou here, there it is. And we keep drawing down and we can figure out what our measurement is. So there it is. Exactly 625 thou. Now that is right in the middle of the range. That's exactly where we want to be. So if we put a shim in there, that's 127 thou, double by two thou um, gap. And if you want to go all the way up to six, you'll use a spacer that's even a little larger than that. So that would be six, 131 thou. So I think 127, 128, 129 thou shim is probably right 
on the money. Time to finish up this hub. The first thing I want to do is get some clearance. I locked it down to check the clearance. So I'm just going to tap the hub a little rearward, outward from the hub. So I got some play there now, so that's good. And the final step is installing the inner oil seal or grease seal. I've already put some silicone down in there to help this thing find its way home. What I want to do is just tap on it ever so slightly, give them very even pressure. Otherwise, these things tend to bend. So I've got this tool here. I'm just going to give light taps and send it home evenly. It doesn't go in even, see like that. I'm going to win it on one side. It'll have a tendency to bend, so I'm just going to be careful with it. Start it there we have it. Hub assembly is totally complete, ready to be installed with the rest of the suspension. I got the shim on the shaft here and just put some tape because I don't want to lose it. Now I should mention that there is another method to putting in the correct shim and that would be taking the largest shim possible, the 151, assembling this whole thing, torquing it down, measuring the end float, then taking it all apart, replacing the shim with the correct one and putting it back together. And that's really the method I see a lot of people do online because they don't have access to the specialist tools. All right, so I am gonna wrap up this video here, but you can see I have been busy doing all the assemblies for the rear end. So we have the new telescopic shock absorber spring assemblies, the hubs down there on the spline shafts we worked on, have the cradle, we have the lower control arms, the radius arms, everything ready to go back together and get this car back on the road. Now here's the main event. This is the rear end that's been fully rebuilt by an absolute professional and that's really nice because i know at the heart of this rear end is a dependable differential and i won't have to go back in there now the rebuilder does want me to add two body, bottles of this ac delco limited slip additive so that's going in there and this is really going to be the start of the final assembly but i do have my work cut out for me look at all these components in cadmium yeah i'm gonna have to assemble the brake system the handbrake system that's all going to happen off camera, guys. So uh, I'll keep you updated on how this differential performs, but that's it for the rear end. Now, as for the 30,000 mile surviving engine here, I've, I've had a discussion with the owner and we will be putting in new pistons because the top piston ring grooves had a little too much play in them. So we're gonna renew this engine. We'll bore it out 10 thou, put new pistons in and renew it. And we may as well go the distance if we've gone this far and deep into the engine. All right, well that does it for this episode. As always, everybody, thanks for watching. If you have any comments, I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. And that's it from me. See you later, everybody. Bye-bye.